Okay, so uh, apologies uh, for the late start here. It's uh, good to be back and um, looking forward to discussing today um, some issues having to do with functional abstraction and the exploratory um, uh, uh, take-home assignment that I provided, um, which I trust that everyone has had a look at and had a chance to work on. So um, last time we uh, started the class out by starting uh, to discuss some motivations for one of the two major topics uh, explored within this class, to wit, um, the use of uh, abstraction mechanisms. And I noted that the class is going to be covering a wide variety of abstraction mechanisms, but one of them that we um, uh, are going to focus on today has to use with uh, has to do with the use of, of functional abstraction. That is using functions to achieve a measure of modularity within a program. Why do we do this? Why use functional abstraction? Why break a program, big or small, up into uh, pieces each associated with with functions? They may be methods in an object oriented programming language, yes. Uh, because you can focus on a certain, uh, if you break up the program, you can focus on each individual aspect. Um, Good. Precisely. Good. Um, so your name? Uh, Peter. Peter. So uh, Peter, I like uh, your comments there. You can focus on those pieces, and that is true. In what way, through what sort of um, tasks might we want to focus on those pieces? How, how might ability to focus on those pieces help with concrete uh, tasks, what what sort of task might might benefit from having those pieces in debugging. place? Sorry, debugging. Debugging, indeed. Trying to trace what's going wrong. Um, it's easy if you have a lot of places where you can intercept it and and, for example, uh, print something out. But even more so you can often stub those functions out and have them say return a fixed value. This is an idea that some of you may have heard me talk about in 371 in the context of what? Where we, where we take a piece of a program that's going to be full featured and we replace it by a much simpler version of itself. Mocking? Yeah, it's mocking, fakes, stubs. These are all words that have to do with this kind of um, this process whereby we'll temporarily put aside the full implementation and use a simpler implementation. And that allows us to have, to sort of control the number of places where things could be going wrong. And of course, modern programming languages um, have uh, tool sets often which allow for straightforward mocking. So JMock or Mockito, for example, in the Java context. So that's good. Um, you might focus on these pieces for the context of debugging. What's another reason we might focus on these pieces? If we're doing what? Development. Development, that's right. So we might divide the program up into pieces and different parties are assigned different pieces, right? They're, they're assigned those pieces for their work in the coming week. You write these functions, I'll write these, and together we'll make a complete program. Good. How about another task that could critically use these pieces to, um, to achieve its goals? Where having those pieces makes the sim situation a lot simpler. Well, very related to debugging, but testing. Precisely. In a giant way, testing. Because if all you've got is one big program, you're testing all pieces of it at once. And often it's hard to, to test the internals when you're going through the interface to the whole program. There's lots of stuff going on within this program and it's hard to get at it or to observe it if all you're doing is just dealing with the program as a whole because it's somehow it has to percolate till down to this section. And at the least it requires a lot of thinking. I remember talking with John McPonsky who was a developer at Microsoft who was writing the core uh, dependency mechanisms in Microsoft Excel. And there was a big function, f 2 add depth, I think was its name, and uh, he had to, you know, very cleverly come up with test cases that would exercise small pieces of it. And the fact that it was broken out as a function itself made the job a lot simpler, rather than if it had just been tied up in a big hairball of code. 
So testing benefits incredibly much because we can test each of those pieces. We can create test harnesses for those pieces. So for all these reasons, functional abstraction is desirable. But it's also desirable to achieve reuse. This was mentioned last time by Eric. Uh, and the fact that it reduces the complexity involved. I mean, we're, we're thinking about calls to functions that hide a lot of the detail and they don't clutter up our names. So the transparency will often be enhanced. Now, I sent you a piece of code. And that piece of code was uh, probably- Insulting my posterity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you. So that piece of code, um, I crafted it to demonstrate certain abominations. Um, but I will tell you um, that for ethics reasons, uh, I was restrained from sharing with you worse abominations <laughs> than have been handed to me by students. Um, oh, no. so, th so that is by far from the worst code I've seen. Um, but I put it in there to, I, I gave you that code to, um, to get the discussion going. But more than that, ladies and gentlemen, to start, or at least to try to advance what I consider a key attribute of a practicing software engineer in today's world which is a sense of aesthetics, a sense of code quality. What, what is sort of acceptable code quality, although maybe arguable, and what is abysmal code quality. And I'm glad to see the reactions. This is good. Let's take a look at that code. Okay. <laughs> okay, um, I should have the TA here to lock the door. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, let's, go, uh, let's go here. So here's Conway's Game of Life. Um, in all its glory. Okay. Um, so, what's going on here, roughly? Roughly speaking, what's going on in this code? Can anyone tell me in terms of the basic flow of the code? It takes in a text file, and then it, it looks for the asterisks in the file, and then it will do the Conway's game like based on the asterisks, and then output the new text file. Okay, okay, good. Um, good, so read in a file, which has some input state, some initial state of this, this cellular automaton uh, broken up into rows and columns here, right? And, and it so happens that it's encoded in a certain way. And uh, was it Arnold? Yeah. I recognize uh, Newton said of Bernoulli, um, one recognizes the lion by his claw. Um, so I recognize your, your good voice, 394. So as it turns out that we're encoding the presence or absence of a cell in a certain way, and, and asterisks denote where a cell is, and, and blanks denote where a cell's not, right? Where, where, it's, where it's empty versus occupied. Okay, so we read that in, and then we do a long computation which has to do with evolving this space according to the rules of the Conway's game of life. Um, and and then finally, and we'll come back to, of course, these things in more detail, we, we go through and we do what here? <coughs> what does this bit of code have to do? That's the output. Right. That's the output. Okay, right. Now, one thing we could do to improve this code from the start would be to put in some comments, right? We could say, read in file, perform computation, write it out. And, you know, that would be... That would be a step forward, but as many practitioners will note in software engineering, if we're going to be putting those comments any, in there anyway, often it deserves its own function. After all, if there's large sections that do X or do Y or Z, um, why not <coughs> carve them out into pieces which can be reused, tested, you know, enhanced debugging, etc., stubbed out. Um, and call them something meaningful, and then just have calls to them, right? Okay, so, so these pieces, the fact that we can describe this code in some roughly meaningful way in terms of phases, it still, itself starts to push us towards some recognition of functional abstractions. So there's kind of chunks of work to be done that can be dignified by placing them in an in a appropriate name, name function. So, you know, I could look at this code and I could piece through what it does. 
But it would be much nicer if it's just called, you know, write, write output or something like that called with a file name. Boom, done. Right? Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on here and in, in reading code too. Um, and we'll come to some comments on sort of the aesthetics of it in a minute. But I want to focus for a moment on, on this portion here, <laughs> which um, uh, probably uh, you folks focused on for a little bit at least. Uh, what's, what's going on here? It's impossible Anyone? to tell because it's so hard to read. <laughs> okay, it's impossible to tell because it's so hard to read. Um, Start by giving like, indentation for the particular <laughs> scopes yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So um, I'll tell you, uh, I had a, a student working for me who would, uh, it's fairly recent, uh, he would uh, flout indentation conventions in the most egregious way. So one of his characteristics is he liked to put lines that were kind of similar to each other um, on successive lines with successively larger amounts of indentation. So you, you'd have, you know, int A, int B, int C, and in, in D, or whatever, and they would each be successively indented from each other. Which, you know, was a convention which was meaningful to him, but it was not very meaningful elsewhere. Um, indentation is one of those conventions which, for some languages, C included, is not part of the language definition. C strips out white space. It doesn't care about it. But we care about it a lot as software developers. And there's some egregious things with indentation here. Some real problems with, with indentation that are far from the worst I've seen. These are pretty minor. I thought about giving you a much worse situation, but I held off because I didn't want to be cruel. <coughs> I didn't want to heap insults at the top injury. <laughs> um, so, so where are some problems with indentation? If we, if we look here and we look up a bit above, where, where are some problems with indentation? Starting off, that second for loop should be in line with that first if statement. Okay. Um, so, so this this one here, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this this has a semicolon after it, and if this is indented, you could easily miss the fact, all right? You could think that all this is logically within the if. We tend to read things um, like indentation as if they're they're communicating something meaningful. And they should communicate something meaningful. They're extremely useful. But we need to be careful to police ourselves, police our projects, so that these conventions are met. And this is an example of a convention where this is all one statement. It ends here with the semicolon. And you could be easily mistaken for thinking this stuff is inside of that. Um, OK, so, so that's an indentation problem. Uh, absolutely. Where's another one? Line 12. Line 12 here, yeah. This is, this is a big one. This is logically inside, inside that. Others? Well, here, right? I mean, yeah. this stuff is logically inside of the if. Um, now we have these kind of one-line if statements, um, which which are sometimes mixed with non-one-line if statements. In short, it's kind of a dog's breakfast of different conventions, if there are any, uh, as far as, as indentation. So that needs to be cleaned up in a big way. And, and that's one of the more egregious things, because after all, um, editors these days can do that for you, right? They'll, they can indent it for you in an inappropriate way. OK. Um, what else, though, is going on here, which is, which is uh, confusing or even perhaps distressing? Single, um, single character variable names. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, single character variable names. Do we need to say more? Um, does that mean it's never appropriate to use single character variable names? Under what conditions might you use a single variable character name? Uh, this case in for loops? Yeah, yeah. That's, 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 if, if, if the meaning of it is clear, um, often we'll consent to that. But here it's, it's egregious, because some fairly significant things are going on here, and they're obscured by 
by the gratuitous use of single variable names. I mean, after all, A and B, what's, what's the meaning of cap A and cap B? And do they have anything to do with little a and little b? Um, no, it turns out that they don't. Cap A and cap B are used for vectors, which alternate on even and odd sort of iterations of the loop. Um, and they deserve a name that, that indicates that, right? Um, what's a, what are A and B functioning as? Uh, right. yeah. yeah, rows and columns here, right? Um, 100 rows, 100 columns. So they could also use an appropriate name, um, right? Um, they could use a name that's 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 cleaner for that. Okay, um, so that's that's good. Um, uh, we could we could uh, deal with that naming, um, and that would be a big step forward. What is I? The step. It's the step. So names that reflect their function, right? Um, reflect their job. This, this should be something to do with this step. Okay, so um, that would shed a fair bit of light uh, on what's going on. What about these computations here? What's what's happening here? Everything's hard coded. There's a lot of magical numbers. Yes. So this is another mm -hmm. issue. Uh, remind me your name. I'm Royce. Right. Uh, Royce. Royce. Yeah, Royce. So a lot of magical numbers. 101, What do you think those numbers have to do with? The size of a row. Size of a row. So number, of, number of columns, number of rows. But why do we see these variants? So, so let, me, let me ask this. Suppose we were to go take this code and we were to want to expand the space to be 1,000 by 1,000 to allow this great program to achieve even more, more, uh, more in the way of insight. What could we, uh, how would we, how would we shift it from uh, 100 to 1,000? Could I just replace uh, 100 by 1,000 here? Yeah, the 100 ones and 99s <coughs> are potentially a bit of a problem, right? Um, or suppose I wanted to switch it to a thousand rows and 500 columns or something like that. Um, then I'd have to figure out which of the one-on-ones were kind of associated with the rows and which with the columns and change them appropriately. Because some of these 99s are, are row associated and some are column associated, but some are the one-on-ones. I guess all of these are actually, now that I'm looking at these right now, um, some of the hundreds are column associated with, and some of the, the hundreds are, are row associated. And so I can't just do a, you know, a, a systematic replace of these, right? You make a minor mistake and then bugs fly everywhere. Exactly. You make a minor mistake, bugs fly everywhere, and I might not notice those bugs, right? Those bugs might go on. They, they make it meaningless, the output, but, but they're silent but deadly, right? Um, so this could easily occur. And you'll notice that um, there's a lot of, of different things here. There's another 9,999, 9, right? Um, which is associated with, um, with the length, presumably, of 100 times 100 minus 1. But it's not, it's not logically linked to that. It's not logically linked to, and it's not explicitly linked to these, these counts. And as a result, this code is just, uh, it's just an accident waiting to happen. Well, okay, maybe it's an accident that has happened. <laughs> but but uh, it's a disaster that, you know, befalls somebody in terms of running this code. This code works, but it, it works in a way that is just waiting to break. You're, you're leaving the door wide open. You know, it's, it's like you live in northern BC where there's lots of grizzly bears and you know, you, you want to avoid grizzly bears, but every night you, you know, leave meat around your kitchen and you leave the door front wide open or something like that. You're just inviting them in. And they might not be limited in the cuisine to the meat um, in the kitchen. So the point is we're, we're leaving the, the door wide open to lots of mistakes, right, with these, with these numbers. We're not tracing the logical dependencies and instead, we're just throwing down magic numbers, 
trying to make it work right now and and uh, trying to get by, but making it a disaster in the future if we want to evolve it. You'll notice that a lot of these things get in the way of change. And much of the motivation for abstraction has to do with insulating ourselves or making ourselves less vulnerable to the risk of change. Why does change occur in programs? Requirements change. Requirements change. Why might requirements change? Suppose you're working for a stakeholder. Why might their requirements change? Different platform. Different platforms. They want to bring it to a new platform. That's right. So they'd like this code in all its glory to run on the iPhone. Um, okay, another another reason. So platforms might change. That's a good one. Why else? If you're giving your contract, you need to sell it to someone. You need to sell it to someone else. That's right. Even with a large customer, things happen. They, you know, you're working for one bank and they merge with another bank, and suddenly the IT systems have to be totally rejigged, and they're using each other's elements. Um, requirements change all the time. Technology advances, UI standards change. You know, customer requests evolve. Um, who exactly you're dealing with the customer? UI feedback is given. There's lots of reasons why things things have to evolve. And much of the art of software engineering is getting in place the requisite flexibility so we can change with the expected changes, but you know, not put so much work in that you're not going to need, in accordance with the Yagni principle. You ain't going to need it. Don't, don't put in a lot of speculative stuff, but put in those things that might well be needed in the foreseeable future as far as evolving. <coughs> okay, so, so magic numbers galore here. Horrible. But what's going on here? I mean, what's what's happening here? Anyone want to try to parse this out? Like, why are we checking if A is greater than zero? And why are we checking if, if B is less than 99? You're essentially just trying to find neighboring cells that are alive and then checking whether or not uh, A and B are in balance with the array. That's right. That's right. So, very good, Josh. So, so if we're here, we've got you know, all eight cells around us, right? Um, if, we're, if we're considering whether this one lives, we've got to, got to consider eight cells. But uh, if we're over here, we don't want to be trying to consider some cell here um, because it's off bounds and we, we, we therefore shouldn't look to see if it's live or else we may get a core dump, right? Yeah. Um, so, so here we're kind of dealing with edge cases, literally cases around the edge of this thing to make sure that we are we are not inducing references that are out of bounds. What is this stuff within within this? What's what's this have? like what's this computation or that computation? What what is that doing? Um, Conceptually. That, if you said you wanted there was uh fully uh so then you're adding that into the main thing because how many neighbors have had. Okay, so that's good. So, so that's good, Arlen. That's exactly right. So this will be this the result of this indexing will be one or zero. But what what's the meaning of this computation? You're basically mapping uh, 2D coordinates to a one-dimensional array. Exactly. You're you're mapping a 2D coordinate to a one-dimensional array. So here we are. You know, we're we're parsing out kind of how this thing is functioning. Um and maybe I'll just, you know, finish it, those high level comments with just something here. What's this, if I, anyone know what this operator is? Anyone remember? The modulo. Modulo, okay. So what's going on here? Checks if it's odd. Okay, and why are we doing that? What's, what's because happening differently? Because you have two arrays, yeah. and every second one you want to be copying to the one. So as you're working through That's right. one, the results as you're going isn't affecting the next, the other things. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Good. So that's that's great. Now, does anyone notice a certain similarity between these codes? Yeah, they're identical. pretty much the same other than A and B. Yeah. Pretty much the same other than A and B. Your name? Eric. Eric, yeah. So uh, almost identical, right? Except A and B is here. Have you ever seen blocks of code that are almost identical? But are but are in the same program? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, 
Okay, um, I'm glad you've been innocent of that uh, previous to this. Um, this happens, in my experience, quite a lot. Um, and in 371, if, you know, browsing through the code, I often encounter that. Sometimes I encounter it for 20 blocks straight, um, you know, where it's just cut and pasted. And it's a casualty often of our ability to cut and paste things easily. Um, why is that a problem that these are almost the same? Why, why do I refer to it as if it's a, an issue? It's why is that an accident waiting to happen? Something that can be easily extracted, but they ignore doing it. Yeah, exactly. If you change one, you have to change the other. Yeah, change one, you have to change the other. You fix a bug in one, you have to remember to fix the bug in the other one, right? If somebody asks us to change these rules so that we're looking at a slightly different rule, now we've got to kind of duplicate that in two different places, potentially making a mistake in the process. In short, there's lots to abstract here at a higher level. It's not just, you know, magic numbers and that sort of stuff. It's, it's um, the logic of what's going on here in terms of counting up the number of cells that are adjacent that are that are one. And conceptually, it's a very simple thing. I mean, basically, what you're doing here is you're counting up the number of cells in the B array next to the current the current cell a, you know, by coordinates A and B that are that are occupied. I mean, that's what this is doing. That's what this is doing in the A array. But it's written out in such a way that it makes it just a headache to look at and potentially problematic to fix or evolve because you've got to do it twice. You've multiplied your work by two. Potentially. How about this thing here? What's, what, is, what is this? What's the meaning of that? That's what assigns each cell, whether it's live or dead, after it's checked its surroundings. That's right. Um, that's right. And can anyone reason through to me sort of what the meaning of this of this expression is, this formula here? It's the, if there are three neighbors, it's alive. It's always or, alive. Yeah. Or if the entire other, like, setup of the logic of it is one. If mm. either of those stay alive, then it will be alive. Okay. It's so a lot more complicated than it needs to be. Indeed. It's a lot more complicated than it needs to be. It's like needlessly obscure. Needlessly obscure. Now, there are places where, there are perverse places where people delight in obscurity. They like to create code that's inscrutable to, to strut their stuff. But those places don't tend to flourish um, <laughs> <laughs> because often they can't figure out their code six months later year later. The customer is banging on the door and you know needs certain changes and the code's obscure. And often the person who wrote it walks out the door, or, you know, moves on and goes into a management position, and then they're left with this inscrutable code. Um, so once again you've left yourself open to problems uh, here and how this is expressed. It's been expressed needlessly cryptically. Um, not incorrectly, but cryptically, and therefore left the the, the gate wide open to mistakes in reason to come in. Um, basically, what we're saying is, you know, the three cells around us were definitely that are live. We're definitely live, um, regardless of whether we're currently empty or occupied. If we are currently occupied, then we're only live if if we have between two and three live neighbors. Um, but it's obscure. Okay, so lots of problems. Here. Lots of problems. How could we? Focus, uh, focusing for a moment on functional abstraction, um, what can we do to improve this code? Functions. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, functions, great, great. Functions where? Give me a couple good candidates for functions. Well, the load and write. Load and write, excellent, great. I mentioned it earlier. How about in this? In this cruft, isolate that block and then supply the arrays that we want to change as arguments. Okay, good, good. Take this block, abstract it away from the vagaries of whether you're currently in, in B and you're going instead to A or vice versa. Abstract it up into a function that will handle both and just 
call it with the appropriate arrays, either A is the first argument, B is the second, or vice versa, and, and you're off to the races. Okay, good. What else could be abstracted here, fruitfully? Well, basically, I want to trace the fact that, folks, we, we, we spent, what, maybe 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes here, um, talking about the meaning of this program. What's behind this? What's sort of the, the logic? What's the, the business logic, the kind of um, underlying um, uh, motivation or meaning, the intention behind certain pieces of the program? A lot of those things that have chunks that have clear intention associated with them can be broken up into a function that captures that intention, it captures that logic, captures that, that meaning with a well-defined name. So there's almost, I could turn around and say, what not to abstract, but, but I like the idea of abstracting these things. What are some other big wins, too, um, on the abstraction front? Placing the magic numbers. Placing the magic numbers, yeah. Um, we could, uh, Okay, um, we could replace the magic numbers with a more abstract quantity that could change. It, it, it takes into account that 99 could result from either the number of rows minus one or the number of columns minus one. Instead, we'll have expressions, right? This will be number of, of rows minus one or what have you. So we've abstracted that so we can now change number of rows and it will ripple through to changes in what's done here. So I like that idea. How about at the functional abstraction level? What else could we could we bring out? What else could we sort of drag out of it? The is alive logic. The is alive logic. I love it. This guy here. We could we could abstract out this. So you know, even if it has to be this gory, at least it's hidden in a function, so you don't have to go through and look at it unless you need to. I mean, look, there's there's ugliness out there. Um, things are encoded in wacko ways. These could have been bit vectors, right? I was toying with that idea, making these bit vectors. But again, I didn't want to, didn't want everyone to drop the clock. <laughs> <laughs> so these could have been bit vectors, right? And I could have anded and ORed them in, and 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 you ain't seen nothing yet in terms of of of, of ugliness of what we could have had. But the point is, we can. We can carve off when ugliness exists, and it does exist out there. There are times where the core thing is pretty, pretty tight and complex. We can at least hide it in a function. So we could take this and hide it in a function. I like it. I like it. Take, take that. Um, what else could we do? What else could we hide in a function? Checks for neighbors, yeah, the count, count up of how many neighbors are. Probably that could be done together with abstracting away from whether you're, you've got it in B and updating A or vice versa. But yeah, the count of neighbors process, the fact that you are counting neighbors. Good, good. Um, how, about, how about this whole thing, whether we have to report right now? I mean, right now, it's, what is this? What is this 10? Is that the number of rows divided by 10? No, it just keeps you updated as the program's running on how far you are along. That's right, that's right. And this is, happens to be a fairly arbitrary, hardwired reporting interval. We don't, we don't need that as a hardwired <coughs> quantity. Um, we could make it, we could you know, make it um, report out based on other criteria, maybe um, change that reporting interval, maybe having it report if something interesting has is, is happened or what have you. So, so there's things we can abstract out here. I like it. Um, there's also things, uh, even in that writing and reading logic, that, are, that can be abstracted. Like, like what? What could be abstracted here? The file name. Yeah, the file name. OK, good. How about something else here that was mentioned earlier? Well, the encoding, right? I mean, there's nothing magic about stars and spaces. Um, Maybe we want to turn it into higher ASCII character blocks and spaces or something like that. We can abstract it out. So in short, there's a lot of places that this code has opportunities for abstraction. Some of those abstractions are matters of giving names to constants. Some of these abstractions are functional abstractions. Okay. Um, now, I want to highlight one thing that 
I remember talking with some of you folks about way back when in 214 space, okay? And that has to do with dependencies and side effects. Look at this code. Look at it. You know, um, uh, so I would even venture some of you might have seen code uglier than this at one point or another in your life. But one of the things that makes this painful to stare at, painful to make sense of is, you know, when we're looking at it, we're not quite sure what the dependencies are. Um, you know, so we see, okay, C plus equals, where was C initialized? Okay, it was initialized. Is this C the same as this C? We can't, uh, no, it's in an else, which are mutually exclusive, so this C is not affected by this block. Um, could, could this C be affected by what went on here? Yeah, yeah, it could. You know, where was B last uh, updated before this? Well, I guess it was in the previous round. There's a lot of hidden dependencies here. And this code actually isn't terrible with the dependencies. But one of the problems of having all the code at once is it's not clear where things were initialized, where they were last used, where they were last, you know, uh, set, set to a value. And that's a little bit obscure. It's not clear entirely by glancing at this on what this depends, or on what this depends. You've got to kind of go A, B, oh, there's a C there, and then the lowercase a and b. It's not clear on what it depends. And that's another thing that can be helped by abstraction. Because abstraction basically can wrap a function around this. And where are those dependencies visible in a function? If, if a function's body depends on certain things, if, if, if we're adhering to sort of good practices, where are those things on which the body normally depends encoded within the function? Where does, where does it get the information to you? So suppose we wrap this up in a function, this, this stuff here. What needs to be carved out? How, how does that function indicate what, it, what information it needs to do its job? It's the what? Parameters. Parameters of the function. So it makes it very clear if we're calling off your function on what this depends, right? It depends, this depends only on B, for example, C, lowercase uh, C, and lowercase A, and B. It doesn't depend on A. This, this doesn't depend on A. And that's critical, because it means we're not in the update rule, we're not taking into account what's in A. And it'll be clear, because we have to pass explicitly what it depends on. Okay, so, so I took a crack at this, and you could, you could have gripes with my style and so on, but I turned it into uh, a set of functions here. So, okay, here's main, right? Um, first of all, I, I went and I pound defined it. This is C, after all. Um, and within the bounds of this assignment, I pound defined it, a bunch of counts, um, and I find it a reporting frequency here. Um, and I find a bunch of functions. I could have put them into a .h file here. And, and then I have a count of cells, appropriately named, which is, this is just a macro multiplication of those two things. And here in main, basically the flow of the program as a whole is, is shown. So we read some state, we run scenario, and we write some state. All right? The basic flow, the basic meaning of the program in terms of its broad operations is pretty clear. Okay, now let's dive down. And per convention, I've tended to sort of put the key bits of logic uh, first. Um, so here's the scenario, running the scenario. The write stuff and the read stuff is, is further down and so on. Oh my gosh, this indentation got screwed up. Editors sometimes do that. I was editing this in a different editor. Okay, um, so mea culpa, this is, this is uh, indented in a wacko way. Um, basically, we run the scenario for a certain number of steps. Right? Um, those number of steps are provided as an argument here. So we know for this to do its job, this is all it, all it needs here. And basically it iterates through successive time steps. So I call these I time um, to indicate as an index in time as opposed to an index in row or column. And basically if, if it's time to, to report, um, then we print something out. But in the meantime, we, we update the space. And we call it with the current time with the space. Now, this update of the space. Oh, by the way, mm, yeah. Um, 
And you'll notice that I get back here the array holding the latest state. And that's going to be sweet. That's going to be sweet because if I run it an even number of times or an odd number of times, the latest state is in a different place. But taking this back allows me to take that and pass it to right state here. So regardless of whether I'm running it for an even number of times or odd number of times, I know where to look for the latest state so I can write it out. I don't have to special case it. If I ran it for you know, an even number of times, the latest state's in A, otherwise it's in B, or they're appropriately named um, analogs. Okay, great. Um, and, you know, here within the update space, this is kind of the, the elements of the, uh, the core logic now. Basically what we're doing is um, we're determining the current and next cells that apply here, which are the cells that encode, that is the, the array that encodes the, the current space, which is the one from the next space. And I pass those in here. These are in stars. and so. What it's doing in this function is basically assigning the appropriate A or B to, to current cells and X cells. And then I, I iterate through this number of counts, right? And I update the next cells uh, according to this, to this row and column. And update the cell basically counts the number of surrounding set live cells, right? Uh, according to the, so the current cells, and so within the current cells array, it counts the number of surrounding cells, surrounding this current row and column, counts the number that are live, and, and then basically I get the index for the current row and column, and I check if it's alive, and based on that, I compute the liveness based on whether the current <coughs> cells alive and the common surrounding cells are alive, and that assigns the next cells. Um, so in other words, this is kind of the liveness calculation that's that core business logic that determines does this does this current patch is it living or dead the next cell and it depends on two things whether the current cell is alive that's in there now and the number of cells around it right um in this compute liveness this is that logic right if the current cell is alive then it only stays living if the number of cells routed are between two and three. Otherwise, it's only, it only is live if the number of cells routed is, is uh, live cells routed is exactly three. So um, this is this logic in a more transparent fashion that we saw. Does that make sense to you? So what I've done is, and this is, by the way, this is very procedural. Um, for those who are course shopping, for those who are trying to figure out whether to take this course, um, we will be revisiting this example in many different languages and paradigms in the course of the semester. We'll see how we'll be able to use aspect-oriented programming to this. We'll see how it runs in Java. We'll see the performance trade-offs. We'll use a profiler to see where it's taking its time, et cetera. But suffice it to say, I've written this in a procedural fashion. What do I mean by procedural, anyone? If I talk about programming languages, um, and I talk about procedural languages versus object-oriented languages versus functional languages, anyone have a sense of what, what makes a procedural language? They really originated in a big way with ALGOL, ALGOL 68 being the most famous one. But they are live and well in the form of C. What do you mean by procedural language? There are C objects. You're just working directly with the memory that you have allocated. Good. And basically, my job in life is to sort of use, uh, uh, to sort of operate on, on data and arrays by calling methods, calling procedures to do the work. We're not bundling up the data with the methods for it. Rather, there's the kind of the methods to operate in the data, and then there's the data. And you know, we pass the data to the methods. That's what's kind of going on here, right? I'm passing references to these arrays and to which cell and column to use to this. Uh, same thing with update space here. Um, here, I'm sort of getting what, what data to update. In an object-oriented way, I tie together the logic, the business logic with the data. Here it's separated out. In a functional language, we'll see that 
we use many similar functional abstractions as procedural, but we're using them in a way that, um, uh, that often allows for higher order functionality because of uh, um, the abstractions permitted by higher order functions. Procedural languages are typically, um, and really this is how the term is used, they're imperative. They involve assignment to arrays, et cetera. In a functional language, you might be taking in a whole array and return a totally new array rather than updating different arrays at different times. So this is a procedural language. I have divided this space up successively into pieces. This has to do with um, sort of hierarchical decomposition. Let me, this, this looks to me so egregious that I want to um, fix it up. Here's hierarchical decomposition, right? Um, I have the whole program, I read state, run the scenario, write the state. This is running a scenario. Running the scenario involves iterating through a successive time and updating the space for each of them. Updating the space involves going through each of the rows and updating the cells. Very procedurally, hierarchically sort of decomposed, right? So you have update program, and this is, you know, read uh, initial state, and this is write, write final state. And this is, you know, uh, run scenario, and run scenario itself includes calling off to, you know, many many calls to run uh, to update um, update space, and update space calls off in turn to update cell. You see the sort of hierarchical decomposition here, and there's other things going on here where I'll call off or what have you. So this is uh, decomposed, and this is, you know, main. This is the program as a whole. So we've decomposed it into these pieces using functional abstraction. Right? Does that make sense? Okay, now let's let's see um, just a little bit uh, how things are, are done here. Um, so here's... Here's compute liveness. We noted this is kind of the core business logic. This is kind of the, the, the heart of the matter as far as the rule. Carving this out has some real attractive properties uh, for a couple of reasons. One thing is it's very clear when it depends. When we were looking before at this, we had to kind of study what it depends. Okay, it depends on C, lowercase b, and, and A and B. Here at least it's clear. It's in you know, it's in um, these arguments. Similarly, every one of these functions has clear arguments associated with it. Count, select, uh, count surrounding live cells here, you know, just iterates through deltas in rows and columns from minus one to plus one. We're just iterating through, if we're updating this cell here, we're doing through. And, you know, if, if we're dealing, if we get to this current space, we just continue on. So here we're saying, okay, is it a legal coordinate? What's this is legal coordinate? What's that replacing? Uh, the, the edge cases. The edge cases, that if, if B is less than 99, do this. A is greater than zero, do that, All right? Does that make sense? Okay, is legal coordinate, right? Now you'll notice that the names here, again, you can quibble with my names, and I'm happy to say there's many conventions out there the issue is to have a team that agrees on a convention and can use it to communicate effectively. So the convention needs to be rich enough to communicate the requisite information and to have team members comfortable enough with it. I happen to use the convention, which was a little bit more wordy, you know, count surrounding live cells. Okay, pretty clear what this, the job of this thing is in its life, right? Is legal coordinate. Index for row column. Um, it's it's pretty clear from these names, update cell, update space. If you came to this code, yes, it would be a little bit more lines of code, but at least it, in terms of its names, it will be fairly clear what the, the job is of certain things, what they're, what they're trying to do. And I even have broken out things like, you know, um, is this illegal textual encoding? So that we can, we can identify, for example, whether there's some some bad characters, illegal characters in the file. Um, and here's the textual encoding for a cell value, right? If this was going to potentially change, I might I might use different characters here. So I've broken this out into into pieces. 
And again, conventions differ with these styles uh, here. Um, you'll find different sub-communities of C programmers who use K and R style, um, or uh, communities of programmers who use um, uh, indentation of the curlies here within it. And there's no one right solution, but you want a team that's consistent. Okay, so I've broken it out into pieces. These pieces could be implemented by different people. They could be tested, they could be debugged, uh, they could be stubbed out, and each one of them has clear dependencies in terms of the others, right? Um, each one of them has real dependencies. Now there is a little bit of logic that's slightly more complex. Determine current and next cells here. You know, if only C had multiple return values supported from a function, it would be sweet. Um, because we could just have multiple return values. Current cells and next cells equals determine current and next cells. We give it time, it returns the array to be used for, you know, <coughs> for the current values versus the next values. Um, but instead, I have to pass these in as what? What, are, what am I doing here? Just a reminder on C, what is this? Passing in the address. Passing in the address, mm -hmm. that's right of this int star. Why am I passing in the address of int star? Because you want to change the same one, not make a copy. Yeah, I mean, so basically I want to pass, what I, conceptually what I want to do, and this comes back to metalinguistic abstraction and language limitations, conceptually what I want to do is I want this function to return next cells and current cells. That's what I want it to do. I want it to, I want to give it time, and I want it to tell me what are the current cells versus the next cells. Which of these arrays, A, what used to be called A and B, cap A, cap B, which of those are the, hold the current values, which holds the next values, right? That's, that was the idea here. But the problem is C doesn't let me do that. It doesn't let me say current cells, you know, in parentheses, current cells, comma, next cells equals this thing. So instead, I pass, I pass a pointer to these guys so that these guys can be assigned inside this function, right? You pass a, a pointer to a, to a variable and then a function that you called with that pointer telling it, hey, put it here, can assign to it, right? And that's exactly what this is going on. Conceptually, this is a little bit of a red herring that this, these are, some, uh, are passed to it it looks like, like you know, it needs this information to do the calculation. It doesn't. It just assigns to these things, um, and it just this is in C is how we do that. So really, there should be a, you know, a, a comment here. Um, but when we pass this in, determine current one. You know, what's going to go on then is, and where is it? Determine here it is. Okay, so we got these double stars going on, right? It's a pointer to a point, right? Or if you take this variable and you dereference it once, you put a star in front of it, put a star in front of it twice, you'll get an int, right? That's, that's how to read that, in case you don't remember your C well enough. This is a pointer to a pointer, so if you take it and you put, two, you, you put a star in front of it, you get a pointer to an int, you put a star in front of the get that you get an int, right? Okay, so here we are, we take these things and you know, uh, we say, is it an even time step? If so, the, the current cells equals um, the even buffer, otherwise the odd buffer, and vice versa for the, for the next cells. So this is the assignment. Conceptually, though, what's going on here, and again, we're going to come back to this over the course of the semester with other languages, I want to return these things. Just, I can't see. Oh, come on. Even in, so we have to use these double stars? Yeah, okay. So, you know, you... You bow to the sea king, and uh, and you 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 do what has to be done. Um, so I have to do it this way, no. But I thought, you know, I, I could do it another way, but this isn't too bad. Um, and so I thought, oh, okay, I'll, I'll I'll do it this way. It encapsulates it. I determine which of the arrays is appropriate. Okay, um, functional abstraction. In terms of testing, in terms of debugging and stubbing, in terms of dividing the work up, in terms of transparency, in terms of understanding the meaning of the program, in terms of evolving the program, 
you could quibble with this code, but it is going to be much, much easier to deal with than this stuff. This is an accident waiting to happen. This is a program which is a little bit wordier, but at least it is transparent. At least you can, if something goes wrong, you can, you can make progress in, in finding the source of problems. At least you can test it. Does that make sense to people? Now, does anyone want to comment, just from the standpoint of a software engineering exercise? I'm sure you folks, you know, tried your hands at, at this sort of thing, and maybe got as far, maybe not. The important thing is you hand something in. Um, remember, it's pass-fail, turning this stuff in, so I want to see something. Um, what comments did you encounter, or can anyone you know, put forward comments on the experience? Having seen how I happen to do it, how would you have done it? Or what issues do you see in, in terms of proceeding? Anyone think that it should definitely be done some other way? I welcome that. Anyone, anyone uh, want to posit something that you struggled with or, or something that you think would be better than this? I would put more comments in my code. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Although, you will find people who argue, well, commenting code is great, naming things clearly is more important than commenting. Because if it's, and you know, the, the kind of best advice out there, if you look at the book on um, refactoring by Fowler, which is a, 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 a classic, what he says is basically most functions or methods, use your name for it, um, should be 10 lines or fewer. And they should have clear names that denote their function. And when you're using, when you have that uh, philosophy, a lot of things that require commenting don't require it quite as, as, um, as keenly. Is it good, Royce? Absolutely. And this code would have been strengthened considerably by, by commenting. Um, but what you'll find is if you're breaking things up into well-defined, well-named pieces, a lot of the sort of most extreme need, most keenly felt need for commenting, um, you know, retreats. Okay, other, other things. These are great comments. Other things. I'll be giving this book to you. Yeah. In the end, to me, it seems like it was a bit <coughs> strange to have all this like I.O. stuff sort of so tight to couple to like the game logic. So I actually put that in a different file. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I, I kept this in a single file just to sort of distribute it easily and so on. But you're right. Um, write state and read state. I mean, conceptually, those should have been um, folded out into a, a separate module, which would uh, could be compiled on its own and is decoupled, because it's not part of the core logic, right? It's, it's the I.O. stuff. Yeah. So it could be I.O.C. or whatever, right? And as such, it could be replaced by another I.O. module, um, and you could have different person responsible for it. So great, great point. Even, Eric, instead, of, even, even, yeah. instead, even instead of file names, you might want to just have it read and write from the standard input or output if you're in a Unix environment. Yeah, so good point. Good point. Um, depending what sort of um, uh, environment you're in, having it read from standard in and output to standard out could have some real flexibility advantages. Because then you could pipe it to another program, which counted the number of live cells at the end, or which generated the initial state from a random distribution. It would allow for a much more flexible architecture. Um, right now, the, the initial state is you know, read from this file, um, which is a little bit awkward if we wanted to have a very nice um, composable possibility of running scenarios with different initial states. And in fact, later in this class, in the pattern section, we'll be talking about the pipe and filter problem, pattern, where basically we can create a system of great clarity, but also flexibility by piping things from one program or one module to another. And we'll see how that can actually be done in, in uh, languages like Scala or Java 8 in, within a program. So that's good. Other, other comments? So why is it that I said 
So I said earlier that much of software engineering, certainly not all of it, but much of it is motivated by this desire to buffer ourselves from the risk of change. I said things change all the time. UI standards evolve, very good new platforms come out, um, new languages come out, uh, but, but uh, more customer requirements change. How might that, so I've made some decisions here um, in terms of what to encapsulate, et cetera. How might this issue of change and the possibility of certain types of change affect how I do things in here? So let me, let me give you an example. Suppose that, you know, I told you, um, uh, the customer for, for this code base wants to be able to evolve the encoding easily. So it's no longer asterisks or Nathan Hales as they're sometimes called and spaces, but um, but instead it oh my God, that's horrible. Um, sorry again, editor editor uh, issue. Um, uh, <coughs> suppose you you know we wanted the flexibility to go from this to um, you know some other some other character based encoding. What what might we do differently? You could pass the character to the program. Good, good. Yeah, we somehow would want to pass down um, information about what encoding to use. Um, and one way to pass it down would be the character to encode a, you know, a live cell or an array of characters, right? You could pass down the live cell versus the, the uh, so the occupied cell versus the unoccupied, what's the encoding of each? What would be another way to, to do it? It could read the file and determine it. On read the file and determine it, that's right. And right now, what we, what we have here is just this calling the cell value for um, uh, textual encoding for cell value. You notice here in right state, basically what I do is I go through each row, I go through each column, right? And basically I determine the index for it and I look it up in the array at that index. So I linear, this is where I linearize it, as Josh was saying, from 2D to, to 1D, right? And I look it up in this array, I get whether it's a one or zero, and then I encode it, and then I put it out. Frankly, I think that's pretty sweet. The fact that you just have this fluent style where you do this, it just functionally functionally compact, right? You determine this, it, it, each successive line sort of transforms it, and then you put it out. But it's at this point that I sort of hard-coded this use of this function. So potentially what I could do is pass in, and that's that's the key, uh, the keyboard, Joel, is it? Kyle. Kyle, Kyle, thank you, Kyle. Um, I, you could pass in here an encoding rule or an encoding information, whether it's you know, information uh, having to do with an array that encodes those values or a character that encodes, you know, an occupied one, you could pass it down and it could use that information here. What's another thing that I could pass down? Well, I'll, I'll use another example. So, so encoding is one thing. We could pass down data about how to encode it. Suppose we were dealing up here with, uh, we want to actually be able to easily change this rule involving, uh, where is it? Um, involving um, compute liveness, this guy right here. Suppose we wanted to have different rules here. We want to allow it to be between two and four and still survive. If the current cell is live, it can have between two and four numbers. How would we, how would we run our program with different assumptions about whether to, about the rule here. How could we do that? Configuration file. Config file. So I like that. We can have a config file that specifies rules. We'd somehow, if we wanted very general rules, we'd have to somehow map those into something executable. Uh, if, we, if all we were going to do is change 2 to 3, 2 to 4, 2 to 5, 
you know, a certain range, we could specify it just with two numbers. But if we want to allow for a truly arbitrary rule here involving just the cone of surrounding neighbors, we might, we might have to somehow have a config file that encodes that rule. But if we wanted a, um, a more general, anything that depends on these two pieces of information, what could we do? We could, we could pass down a function pointer, right? How many people here have used function pointers before? Okay. Um, how many people are not scared of function pointers? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so a function pointer would provide a way to sort of abstract away from which particular function we're using here, whether we're using this one or another one that has other values, we could simply determine it at runtime. And maybe it's because it's encoded in a config file that's compiled to a function, or maybe it's, it's a function in some library that we can pass in. The, path, the point is, instead of just calling compute liveness with a fixed, uh, you know, calling this function, we can instead call a function pointer, right? And that would allow it to easily evolve this program in terms of what rule we use. So we would structure this program differently. Among other things, that function pointer would need to be passed into uptake cell as one of its parameters. And that means in turn that it would need to be passed into update space so it can pass it in turn to update cell, et cetera. Or that would be one way to do it. So what I'm trying to get at, and we'll see this during the semester, is that this code, the decisions we make about this code, how it's structured, depends on our sense of what needs to be abstracted, which in turn depends on our sense of what might evolve within this program. Right? How things might evolve, what things we need to keep flexible, what things we can safely hard code. Structuring a program is not independent of those things. It depends very much on those things. And and uh, this code will evolve over the course of the semester. I don't mean necessarily the C part of it. We'll be doing it in Java, et cetera. But it will evolve as our sense of what's needed flexibility-wise changes. Okay, a little exercise here, okay? Um, so now let's, um, we'll be revisiting this. Let's, let's pack, you know, come back up to this higher level. Um, so why functional abstraction? Well, easier modifiability, transparency, easier reuse, um, reduced complexity, and, and, and modularity. Why modularity? We talked about it last time, right? Separation of concerns. We want different pieces of the program to divide up kind of the reasoning involved in different things. And I heard it from Eric earlier. That's a very nice point. Very nice point. Um, that that having a separation of concerns in this program might involve separating out the core logic, the business logic, as we say, the kind of the, the core meaning of, of the operations on the one hand from the I.O. on the other, right? So you separate those out, and you might put them in a different function. Much, I would say it'd be a different module. Much of our job as software engineers, ladies and gentlemen, has to do with the separation of concerns. It has to do with putting different pieces of a system in different places. Where do we see that in in uh, web programming? Separation of concerns. The front end JavaScript stuff is usually separate from the server side stuff. Good. Yeah. And I argued last time that that entangling pieces like that is the route to madness. King Lear said it first, although Shakespeare wasn't thinking about web programming. <laughs> um, but separation of concerns, whether it's at an architectural level or at a programming level, is often sort of central for how we, we reduce complexity and how we reduce mental clutter, not needing to worry about certain things and how we enhance testability, right? Divide and conquer um, strategies and, um, you know, it helps all through these, uh, these, these pieces. So I've tried to emphasize uh, risk of change is a key motivator for abstraction here. Um, and picking our abstractions carefully uh, according to what things we think are likely changes, you know, the rules for the update, what the file names are, right? right? Which file names we're reading and writing from, um, the size of the space, 
um, the encoding. Those are all things which could change in this program. And, and they would influence our decisions about how to, how to express it. So I don't know if, if in previous classes you would have covered the IB principle. How many people are familiar with this ac acronym? Yeah, no, okay. You ain't gonna need it. Um, the idea is we don't wanna over-engineer something where, because effort put into one side of the program is opportunity cost. It prevents us from putting that time into something else. And in general, we want to anticipate, we want to be able to balance desire for flexibility against the fact that not all changes will be needed. And so typically what we'll do is, and this is particularly keen in a, in a strong part of agile processes, such as extreme programming, um, uh, such as Scrum, et cetera, um, we, want to, we want to get constant input from the user and put in the flexibility that's needed based on their comments. So, you know, these abstractions that we put in, it's not merely that we put in place monolithic pyramid-like abstractions that are, you know, um, offer platonic beauty into our programs. We put it in because they buffer us from change. They, they prevent us from having to rewrite large sections of the code under pressure and potentially, you know, with errors, uh, based on user changes un, uh, in an unnecessary fashion. They help us, they help us uh, handle those changes more gracefully. Okay, um, things that, that uh, are going to anticipate changing frequently will abstract out. We'll put them in a function, we give them nice arguments instead of having it hard-coded, or we'll provide mechanisms to pass a pointer to a function or what have you. So for the most part in this lecture, what I've talked about is one of two types of parameterization. Two types. Abstraction by parameterization is one of them, and abstraction by specification is another. And this gets to Royce's comment about the use of, of uh, comments. And we'll be seeing, and you'll be contributing, um, some better comment. Because one use of commenting is just to explain the code. Explain, explain the flow of the code. I argue, you know, with good naming and so on, the need for that is reduced. But what is a very strong, recurrent, abiding need is the need to actually indicate the interfaces associated with functions, or in fact, with any abstraction. What does it need to do its job? And what job is it going to do for you if you give it the requisite information? So in abstraction by parameterization, what we're doing here is we're taking out, um, taking a situation where things are hard-coded uh, and instead putting it to a place where we parameterize a, a function or some other abstraction. So in the case of functions, we have formal parameters, okay? So let's take a look at the code that we were looking at uh, here. So. Here we have uh, some code, and, and I'll contrast it to here, right? Here we have main. What does main take as an argument? Nothing. Nothing. In Australia, they have a more florid way of describing it. Um, but uh, it takes nothing at all. Zippo. Okay, um, it doesn't make it clear what it depends on, what information it needs to do its job. Here we have functions, each of which take an argument that says, okay, you give me the current time and I will update the space. Or you give me a count of steps and I'll run the scenario for that many steps. Um, you give me the int and row of a column and information about where to find the current values and where to put the next values and I'll update the cell. Um, these are an example of abstraction by, by parameterization. We can reuse that same code in many places with many different assumptions by passing it different arguments. Okay, um, so here, you know, we can, we could use the same function to do the update, no matter whether we run or run the scenario for a thousand time steps or a million time steps, we just give it a different value for its parameter, right? We, we here um, are going to do 
run scenario, we'll call it a thousand with a thousand or with ten thousand or with a million, right? So we parameterize functions. Instead of hard coding it like we did in the original code, Conway's Game of Life Ugly, where it's hard coded, we instead abstract it out into a parameter. So abstraction by, by parameterization can be used to handle many, many cases, right? And um, while the parameters may differ, the basic behavior of the function is the same. Um, uh, what we haven't yet really dealt with, though, is, is making it really crisp as to what the job of these different pieces are, OK? Um, and we've used names that kind of indicate at an informal level what, you know, what things do. Um, but it would be highly, highly desirable, as Roy's perhaps was anticipating, if we could have, if we could have uh, enough in the way of comments, enough in the way of specification to make it clear what the meaning of the code is, what the, what the meaning of a given function is, so we don't have to, you know, don't have to go look into it, right? This is. This is a simpler function to look at, but we still got to kind of look at what's going on to really know what this means or what this means. And this is going to get us to the next um, to the next uh, uh, component, which is what we're going to talk next time about abstraction via specification. And here, ladies and gentlemen, each function needs to be paired with clear comments, um, typically they're comments. Uh, increasingly, programming languages um, incorporate mechanisms to understand them automatically, specifications that indicate the meaning of that function. By meaning here, I mean, what is the job accomplished by compute liveness? What, it, what, is, what, is, what is it that it needs? For example, can this be negative? Is this limited to 1 and 0? Uh, is, can this be uh, negative? Is it it's limited to things that are, that are non-negative? And what's the, the meaning of its return value? In order to understand that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to use this abstraction by specification, where we not only parameterize it, we actually provide a specification that indicates its meaning so that someone can figure out, is this function um, Kind of do the job I want without having to look at its body. Okay, so abstraction by parameterization is part of part of the elements of achieving reuse, part of the elements of achieving modularity. But another component will be adding the specifications needed to safely reuse this code. And we're going to examine that next time for functional abstraction on Thursday. Um, but then. We're going to go on and we're going to look at it for class based abstraction too, in the form of the. Anyone want to guess who's been in 371? Where do we see specifications coming to the fore with, with, with uh, class based or interface based uh, reuse? This got substitution principle? And subtyping. Okay, so we're going to see that, um, and, and, and we're going to see that in coming lectures. But next time, we're going to talk about using specifications in this code to clarify the meaning of these particular functions. And this goes to Royce's comments uh, as to the desirability of comments. Not so much to capture just the flow of logic, but also to capture the meaning of these pieces. It's going to be key. Okay. So um, that's for next time, and I'll have a little assignment associated with that. Do remember, those, uh, those take-home exercises account for almost a quarter of the grade. So do take them seriously, but they are pass-fail. So it's your chance, and you can work on them to get ahead, you know, with, uh, to get essentially perfect marks on a large segment of the course. So be sure to put in some time, okay? Thanks very much. Oh, I did post, for anyone who's interested in projects, I posted a ET1, which has two dozen or something possible project ideas that I put out there. If anyone wants to, to think broadly about possible projects, thanks very much.